Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MedStar Health's latest Facebook Live broadcast. My name is Andrea Rowan, and today we're talking about what else? COVID-19, the vaccine, and your children as they head back to class for the upcoming school year. The success of the vaccines has given children, families, and educators an opportunity to regain some sense of normalcy, as most schools in our area are inviting students and staff back into the facilities for the fall. Right now, almost half of all Americans are fully vaccinated. In Maryland and the District of Columbia, that number is around 60%. In Virginia, 55%. However, when you consider recent news on virus variants, eligible age groups, potential side effects, vaccine hesitancy, and more, we are set up for a school year like none other, full of uncertainties, and big questions for families. We hope to have some answers for you and your families. Let's introduce our panel. Joining me today is Dr. Ruth Cantula, Pediatric Infectious Disease Specialist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. Dr. Tia Raglan, a pediatrician at MedStar Health. Dr. Nahid Ahmed, a researcher at MedStar Health Research Institute in the Center for Health Equity Research. Srijana Pukarel, a MedStar Health associate and mother of two who made the decision to have her 13-year-old daughter vaccinated, and Mashan Bowman Carter, our social media specialist who is going to help us monitor your live questions. Please don't forget to ask your vaccine questions in the comments section below. We promise to get as many as we to get as many as we can during our broadcast. So let's begin with Dr. Ruth Cantula for an update on exactly what we're dealing with. Dr. Cantula, the Delta variant is clearly making an impact. It's headline news, and reportedly some 94% of all new cases are due to the Delta variants. We're seeing COVID cases rise again as we did last summer. Can you explain why this is happening and who should be most concerned about these variants? Thank you, Andrea. That's a great question to start off with. As you mentioned, the cases are on the rise again and the predominant circulating virus is the Delta variant. The Delta variant is a mutated version of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and that's the virus that causes COVID-19. What we're seeing is an example of what viruses do over time in nature, and that is that they mutate or change their genetic code. Based on these genetic changes, the Delta variant appears to be a very fit virus in that it spreads efficiently between people um, and that's why it's quickly become the predominant virus in the US. As you mentioned, the CDC tells us that 93% of the circulating SARS-CoV-2 viruses are, are 93% of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses are circulating, that are circulating in the US are the Delta variant. Um, and finally, um, to the last part about your um, to the last point about who should be concerned, mm -hmm. I think everybody should be concerned. Um, this rise in cases is a sign that the pandemic is not over. And as much as we want it to be over and to go back to what our lives were in pre-COVID, unvaccinated people are the ones who are at the greatest risk of um, getting this infection. Um, and this is a time, especially um, with children going back to school, as you mentioned, that um, we should focus on being more diligent about preventing the spread of the virus. Um, that we have to remember that 50% of the children who are going back to school are not eligible for vaccines and hence will be unvaccinated. Are, um, it's my, oh, sorry, Andrea. No, go right ahead, I'm sorry. And I was just gonna just say, it's my opinion that everybody who is eligible to get the vaccine should be vaccinated. And again, that includes young children because we've been hearing that COVID isn't uh, dangerous for young children. That's correct. I, everybody should be vaccinated, including the young children who are 12 to 15. We're dealing with a different variant compared to last uh, or last summer. Well, turning to pediatrician Dr. Tia Medley, as we brace for the impact of the COVID variants, Dr. Medley, how important is it for eligible children to get vaccinated before the school year begins? Yeah, Andrea. So I'll just piggyback on what Dr. Cantula said, and that the bottom line answer is very important. Um, vaccination affords the best protectivity against getting ill should they get COVID regardless of being vaccinated. Um, and so it's absolutely important that uh, as many kids as possible get vaccinated since they are gonna be back in school and mingling and interacting with one another. 
And we're talking about more than just vaccinations for COVID-19, correct? Absolutely. So um, the schools have always had a prerequisite of requirement for vaccines, um, the kind of normal childhood vaccines. And so even more currently that should be done. Um, part of it is because we know that when people who are at risk or have um, are not covered in, in certain areas for other conditions, if they contract COVID, um, the infection, that they're more likely to have more significant symptoms. So it is absolutely imperative that you be covered as much as possible vaccination from a vaccination perspective. This is that time when parents are bringing <laughs> their children to pediatricians for those regular vaccinations. Can they all be given at the same time, those uh, uh, for whooping cough, and mumps, rubella, and COVID? Absolutely. Um, so there was um, initially when the vaccines were first uh, recommended to be given to children 12 and up, um, there was uh, initially a statement about waiting two weeks between vaccines. And they've since said that that's not necessary. And so there's no need to wait that time period between getting vaccines. So all of them can be given at the same time. And we say that children should have these vaccines. What's the timeline? If my child's school opens August, mid-August or August 30th, or my child's school opens after Labor Day, do I have time to get both doses for them to be considered fully vaccinated? Absolutely, There's, um, it's a 21 day period between the first and the second vaccine with Pfizer, which is the only one that uh, children 12 to, to 16 can receive. Um, and so if they were to get it sometime in the next one to two weeks, then they would be getting it right at the time that school starts. Um, but even if they weren't able to be fully vaccinated, um, initiating that first process as soon as possible is still going to afford them some coverage. And so even if it's a week or two into school starting before they get the second dose, there'll still be, there'll still be good coverage. All right, Dr. Medley, thank you. Let's move on to Dr. Nahid Ahmed, who is studying vaccine acceptance in our area. Dr. Ahmed, based on what we know, why would anyone not be getting their children vaccinated at this point, yet we understand that a majority of parents nationwide are still hesitant about that. Can you explain it? What's the reason? Sure. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so what we're finding is that a lot of parents have concerns about the vaccine safety and efficacy, specifically side effects from the vaccine, long-term effects of the vaccine, and then as the vaccine provides protection against the new variants, which we're finding currently it does. Um, additionally, there's this... Um, difference in risk perception in that many parents are actually more afraid of the vaccine than the virus itself and the belief that the virus doesn't have that severe impact on children, so the vaccine isn't necessarily important. But with these new variants, as Dr. Kandula stated, there is this urgency around getting everyone vaccinated. So we were talking before racial, political, cultural, age, access issue may have come into play for people being hesitant. Are those still also primary factors? Yes, absolutely. Um, the most recent vaccine data shows that key populations are lagging behind in vaccination rates, specifically Republicans, rural residents, and also younger people as well. So given that we're seeing lower vaccination rates in these specific populations, they speak to the need for um, targeted outreach and also um, investment and resources in terms of educating them about the efficacy and safety of the vaccine. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about outreach and education, but like to turn to Shrijana Pukarel right now. And we're very curious about your reaction to this as a mother who's already made the decision to have her child vaccinated. How concerned are you that so few eligible adolescents have been vaccinated? Thank you, Andrea. And uh, first of all, I wanna thank MHRI and the organizing team as well for providing me this opportunity to share my experience as a parent regarding COVID-19 vaccination. So my daughter, Shreya, who's currently 13 year old, um, got her uh, COVID-19 Pfizer vaccine back in uh, May and June. At the beginning, when it just came out, um, you know, when it, when it was just approved under emergency use authorization, it wasn't easy actually to decide. Um, I guess it's a maternal instinct or, you know, as a parent, I guess we always think, overthink, and uh, even though myself, I had already taken the same vaccine, but when it comes to your own child, I guess you really take time and you know, you, you, you think and rethink whether she should receive it. But you know, I definitely um, 
looked more closely the study data, like, you know, the Pfizer had published the data, like this is 100% effective among, among 12 to 15 years old. And that was actually one of the very uh, convincing and, um, uh, you know, uh, reassuring the helpful in decision making. And once I kind of made my mind, I talked to my daughter, uh, I share uh, what I, um, you know, I had all the information, you know, at that age, she also already had all the, some information and she had some concern, actually, very genuine concerns. And, and uh, we went through together, um, mainly she was uh, very worried and scared about the second dose because she had seen in the classroom that some of her classmates had a really bad, like, you know, the, um, the arm, uh, sore arm. And one of her classmates almost like passed out uh, in the class after the second dose. And also like uh, there was a video, I guess it's a rumor video that in a TikTok, like they're talking about the magnet will stick in the area where in the injection site and all that. So we went over all her concerns together. I tried my best to resolve. And um, after um, our talk, you know, her first reaction was like, mommy, I hate needles but I'm mm -hmm. excited about this one because I can go back to school and um, in person and I can enjoy my life again. So that was her first reaction. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, so once we made our mind, we went to one of the mass vaccination sites. Um, luckily, she didn't have any of the um, bad side effects. She did very well. And now she's very happy that she's fully vaccinated and protected against COVID-19. So as a parent, of course, safety and efficacy was the main factor in decision making as a parent. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she you discussed this with her and she was happy to get back to school made your decision a lot easier to. Yes, for her going back to school in person was the main thing. Very good. We'll talk more with all of you, but let's turn sure. right now to our own Michan Bowman Carter. She's been monitoring questions from our Facebook Live audience. Michan, what do we have so far? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Andrea. We have quite a few questions coming in from social media. So thank you for sending those to us and keep them coming. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Medley. Um, multiple people have asked this question. They are parents of children who are uh, younger than the age of 12 and um, no longer, uh, or not yet able to get vaccinated. Um, this comes from Casey and Kimberly who asked similar questions. So how can parents keep their children safe um, when they're not eligible to get vaccinated, especially when they're gearing up for school and they have classrooms of a large size. Absolutely. So I think part of it is one, making sure that the school has um, processes in place um, to protect them. So making sure that there is some um, attention paid to to distancing or social distancing as much as possible to make sure that there is hand sanitizer readily available for those kids um, and to make sure and talk really um, specifically with kids about the importance of keeping the mask on. Um, I know a lot of the kids will say after a while, it just feels uncomfortable, um, but just stressing to them the importance of keeping it on, not only just to protect themselves, but to protect other people, right? So we are in a community and we wanna make sure we're looking out for each other. Um, and so I think as long as they're doing that, making sure they're doing frequent hand washing um, is the biggest thing. But I, I absolutely 100% believe that kids should return to school um, because we have seen so much more of a negative impact of kids not attending school because of the social aspect um, of everything. So I do think it is important for them to return to school. But I think as long as they're doing those, those bottom line basic um, things, then they should be fine. And oh, and making sure that kids don't go to school sick. I think that's the most important thing for parents to make sure if they have any symptoms, just keep them home. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, we have another question from uh, Natasha. Um, she asks uh, about side effects. Um, so she's very concerned about, uh, she's seen disturbing reports about side effects for not just adults, but also children. So can you also speak to this and address the concerns? Sure. Um, so the first thing I would say is um, I have two teenage boys. <laughs> I have two teenage boys. And so we went through this whole situation when I talked to them about receiving the vaccine themselves, which they did. Um, but part of it is they're big on TikTok. And so there were all these different stories that they saw. Um, and we sat and watched, I sat and watched the videos with them just to dispel a lot of the myths. I think there's so much concern and worry out there 
um, but there's also a lot of false information out there. So I would absolutely recommend that people go to reputable sites to look at what those side effects are. Um, the side effects from the COVID vaccine are not that much different from the side effects of your general regular childhood vaccine. So pain at the injection site, sometimes soreness, um, there can be a fever. Um, <clears throat> the one thing that we have seen in pediatrics, but it's very rare, um, is the effect. Um, there can be something called myocarditis or pericarditis, which is basically inflammation of the muscle of the heart or the lining of the heart that they've seen as a consequence or a, um, complication from getting the vaccine. But that has not been shown to be anything that's been long-term. It typically self-resolves. Um, and so it's not something that we've, I've not seen it at all. Um, it's not reported at a high rate whatsoever, um, but those kids have not had any long-term effect from that either. So there's been no neurologic symptoms. I know that's been a big one that's been out there that has been associated with children receiving the COVID vaccine that I am aware of. Um, so a lot of those things are just false narratives. So I think um, just trying your best, definitely reaching out to your pediatrician to ask questions, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I was gonna say is I think it was wonderful that Shajana, Shajana talked to her daughter about it. Um, I actually had a parents that I spoke with about this very topic this morning and they said their daughter was still hesitant. And I said, well, I'll call her and talk to her. So even, you know, pediatricians are gonna be happy to speak to the child, they're gonna be happy to speak to the parent. So definitely reaching out to them to get your questions answered would be a good idea as well. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, I have another question. This one is for Dr. Cantula. It comes from Stella. Uh, she asks, is it okay to get the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine if they have been previously uh, vaccinated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Um, so thank you for your question, Stella. It's a very good question. Um, so the answer, the short answer to that is essentially yes. It's okay to get the Pfizer, sorry, the John, sorry, the Pfizer or Moderna having received the um, Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, and the reason for the reason that I would say that is that the efficacy of the, um, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine in terms of um, is slightly higher. All of, all of the vaccines prevent uh, serious illness and can keep you out of the hospital. Um, and then it's just a, a matter of timing when you would think about getting the vaccine. Um, so I, I don't have any issues if she decides to get the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Cantula. Uh, back to you, Andrea. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. I'm going to follow up with Dr. Cantula on that. Uh, no problem getting the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine after you've had Johnson & Johnson. I think in the news yesterday, there was some uh, talk about what was happening in the San Francisco Bay Area where they were recommending it, would that be considered boosters? Because a lot of people have been asking about booster shots. Well, we need booster shots. So, so that, that would be an example of a booster, um, which is why I mentioned it's important to think about the timing of when you get the, um, the Pfizer or Moderna shot. As I mentioned, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does prevent you from getting a serious illness that would put you in the hospital. Uh, the conversation about booster shots um, comes from the research from immunocompromised individuals. So there are some studies that show that among immunocompromised, there's little or no um, immunity after receiving the Pfizer or Moderna. Um, and so the idea of giving booster shots to our elderly and our immunocompromised is something that's coming up. There are some um, countries that have already started doing this. And then additionally, there is ongoing research right now um, within the trials looking at uh, booster shots and how long you get immunity after that. All right, Dr. Cantula, thank you. I wanna go back to Dr. Medley following up on uh, Michan's questions from our audience about keeping your family safe in the classrooms. And you talked about frequent hand washing and whatever, and one student was still hesitant and you told the parent you would talk to her. What would you say to that young person who is hesitant about getting the vaccine, about being safe in school? Um, absolutely. So the first thing I would do is make sure that um, find out from her what her anxiety or what her concerns are, and then directly address those. But a part of that is, <clears throat> excuse me, is to remember that we have germs in our world every single day. And there's 
things that we can get all the time. And this is a, we're going into the fall season. So you got very common cold viruses and things like that that come up. And so the same way we protect ourselves against those things are the same things we need to do to protect ourselves against the COVID virus that's going around. Um, and so it's not this super bug or it's not, you know, just kind of dispelling the worry that this is something altogether totally different than anything we've experienced before. The situation is absolutely different. We've never experienced this in our lifetime, but the, the, the virus itself is a virus. And so the best way to protect ourselves is the same way we would try to protect ourselves against any virus. You were talking about uh, hand washing and keeping your children safe in school. As a parent of two youngsters, what are you looking at in the school building, in the school setting itself to make sure that your children are safe, that other people should be looking at as well? Absolutely. Um, so one of the things was just looking at one, uh, making sure that they had some minimal distancing available to them to make sure that they're protected Two, to make sure that the teachers were reinforcing the wearing of the mask for those students. Um, three, to see what their policies were regarding other kids that are sick, right? So sometimes kids get through the door if they're not feeling well. How quickly do they, they identify those kids? Is the nurse brought in right away to make sure that those kids are pulled to minimize exposure to other students? And then what's their policy for return for those kids um, so that they're not, you know, at, causing other kids to be at risk from getting sick mm -hmm. are like the biggest ones. Shrijana, how are you talking to your children about safety precautions like the ones Dr. Medley recommends? And describe your 13-year-old daughter's uh, reaction to those uh, conversations. Sure. Um, so yeah, so before I say that, I just wanna say that how you talk to your children, I think it's uh, how you approach and how you talk is, I think it's very different for a different age group. Mm. So if I'm talking about my 13-year-old, you know, our conversation, our you know, topic of discussion is completely different than how I talk to a seven-year-old. Because for seven-year-old, it's just like any other thoughts. Um, you know, uh, he gets in a doctor's office. What he cares only is he uh, want to go outside and play. But on the other hand, with the older one, um, because since they also have lots of information, you have to be more careful and you have to provide more detailed information. So as far as the uh, safety precautions I discussed with my 13-year-old, I feel like she's, you know, really mature for her age, and um, she's really aware that even though she's vaccinated, there are so many people out there they're still not vaccinated, mm -hmm. and they might be, uh, you know, COVID-19 infected. So, so she will continue to, um, you know, follow her uh, hand hygiene, the mask, and the social distancing at her level best. I can see or witness that when we do the quick grocery trip, I can see how she does everything there. Sometimes it's so funny. The children, they actually they comply with the changes um, so much better, actually so much better than adults. So, and, um, but yes, at home, I, I uh, emphasize that uh, the um, basic guideline, the hand hygiene, the um, distancing a mask and also starting this pandemic, I, I guess everyone does it, but we also have a set of rules in the house. When they come back from the school, there is a very specific area, the allocated area where they keep their book bag. They go straight to the bathroom to take a shower. And when they come back, they use the sanitizing wipe to uh, wipe their laptop and the phone and the charger when they're using back again in the house. So I think this is what they were doing last semester as well when they started the hybrid and, and, and this will continue. And they're perfectly okay with that. And because mm -hmm. they, they, as I said, they're very uh, serious um, about it and they're very concerned about it and they wanna protect themselves and the family. And I think it's based on those conversations you've had with both of your children as a family that makes the difference. And we'll talk with Dr. Ahmed about those kinds of conversations a little later. Uh, Dr. Cantula, for children who are getting vaccinated or who've already been vaccinated, how long should we expect them to be immune to the virus? Do we know? Thank you for that question, Andrea. That's a, another great question. The answer to that is that we actually don't know how long the immunity lasts from the vaccine. Scientists are still looking at the data from the vaccine trials. Um, and so they're still reviewing it and collecting that data. The information that we have seen is that for Pfizer and Moderna, we've seen that people have protection at six months. And when I say at six months, it just means that the data has been reviewed six months post 
vaccination. Um, and so with that, um, just know that the data collection is ongoing. I had mentioned before that um, there are some studies that suggest that immunocompromised individuals have lower or little immunity. Um, and so I just wanted to clarify what that means. So when you think about someone who's immunocompromised, their baseline immunity is different from a normal healthy person. And so they may need that booster as we talked about, whether it's a third dose of the vaccine to help their immune system make a response that's equitable to a generally healthy person. The other thing that we don't know is how um, if any of the vaccines last longer than the other, and we're still learning about that. The other question, and we talked about this with Dr. Medley, is one of the side effects, this rare heart inflammation in young people, especially uh, young boys under the age of 18. Tell us more about that and about side effects that parents and children should be on the watch for after they get, especially the second dose of either Pfizer or Moderna. Sure. Um, before I start talking, I just wanted to first underscore what you and Dr. Medley have said, that this is an extremely rare side effect that has been reported um, to the CDC among some people who've received the mRNA vaccines. Um, and so this inflammation, as Dr. Medley uh, described, is called myocarditis. And myocarditis refers to inflammation of the heart itself or inflammation of the tissue uh, surrounding the heart. Um, what these reports said, or what we know from these reports, are that no deaths occurred. It, um, the myocarditis actually occurred predominantly in young males, less than 30. When they did the calculation to figure out how many cases there were per doses of vaccine, they came up with about 40 cases per million second doses, or per million doses of the second vaccine. Um, for many of the individuals, the symptoms happened within the first seven days after the second dose of the vaccine. Um, and as Dr. Medley said, that um, their symptoms were able to resolve over time and were managed with um, inflammatory medications like NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We are still, or the CDC is still following up on these cases to look at long-term outcomes. In terms of symptoms that as you know, family members and as providers that we should be looking for. Um, so symptoms of myocarditis include shortness of breath, chest pain, and palpitations. Um, and then recommendations out of the American Heart Association and the um, American College of Cardiology recommends that for individuals who participate in exercise that they should uh, stop exercising until their heart completely recovers. I think the most important thing to know about what's come out of this data is that the advisory committee, which is the group of individuals that gives um, practice guidance to the CDC, looked at all of this data and they said that the benefits of getting the COVID vaccine outweighed the risk of the myocarditis after vaccination. And so that vaccination should continue. All right, Dr. Cantula, thank you for that. Dr. Ahmed, it sounds as if, except with these rare exceptions, that the vaccines are working perfectly, but a lot of students and their parents are still deciding whether the vaccine is worth it. When getting families the facts, why is it important to inform both the parents and the child? And we talked with Srijana about this in their conversations with the 13-year-old and seven-year-old. And I think it makes a point of what you're about to tell us. Exactly. Um, as Shri Jana and Dr. Medley um, explained so well, the importance of talking to parents and children is that both have questions and concerns about the vaccine. And from our research on addressing vaccine hesitancy, we know the importance of speaking to both parties about um, any questions they have, safety concerns that they have, and answering those questions in a non-judgmental, easy to understand way um, that addresses their concerns and, you know, hopefully um, relieves any um, concerns they have. And, you know, if at that specific appointment, they don't decide to get the vaccine, hopefully the door is still open for them to have a continued conversation. Additionally, we know that parents and children have trusted sources of information, whether it's social media, physicians, community members, et cetera. So it's really important to leverage those trusted sources in the community, whether it's pediatrician, community leaders, for example, pastors, priests, rabbis, imams, to get the message out about how important it is to get the vaccine and how, um, you know, not only to protect them, but also to protect their community members. So 
there are different strategies that we can use to address those concerns, but definitely parents and children need to be involved in those conversations. There's still a large segment of the population that still says even that trusted messenger, if my doctor told me to get it, I wouldn't get it. It's kind of hard to understand, but then states are still trying. What do you think about the incentives, the gift cards, the lotteries, the, all the giveaways? Do they really uh, move the needle even just a little bit? You know, it's like if we save one, that's, that's something. So the incentives could potentially work in the evaluations of these um, methods for increasing vaccination. It's actually been fairly mixed. They haven't shown a dramatic increase in people lining up to get the vaccine. So in terms of trusted sources, maybe if it's not the physician, then we need to think about other trusted sources, whether it be family, friends, neighbors, just in terms of getting the word out about the importance of getting vaccinated. All right, Dr. Ahmed, thank you. Let's hear from some of our Facebook Live audiences. Michan, what are they asking? Thanks, Andrea. We have quite a, quite a few questions uh, coming in. Uh, this first one is uh, for Dr. Medley. It comes from Laura. Um, it's a two-parter, so um, this is what they say. As a teacher, I am concerned for a multitude of reasons. I have an, my own vaccinated uh, teenager, but with Delta, should she go back to school in person? Uh, it's a high anti-vax area. So presumably not a lot of other people in the school are vaccinated. Um, so what do you recommend? Um, so, um, and thank you for your question. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things I always say to my parents is it is absolutely a personal decision, right? So I am making, I'm talking to you from a general perspective, but you have to make a decision based on what best fits your family. Um, I am a, a very, strongly believe that kids need to be in school. I think that the social impact of not attending school is so is so great. And we saw a large number, a large increase in the number of kids with anxiety disorders and depressive disorders over the last year, that I think that it is more important for them to attend school. That said, the masking, the social distancing, and the hand hygiene are all were all put in place before people were vaccinated to mitigate spread. So the same way you now have vaccinated people and you have unvaccinated people, those same things, the hand washing, the, the social distancing and the masking are what's gonna help mitigate continued spread, even from people who are not vaccinated, the same way it was mitigating it before we had vaccines in place. Um, and so I would say, as long as the school is pushing that and making sure that that's occurring for those kids, especially if they know it's a population that is a high, a high rate of um, non-vaccinating people, then, then you should be okay as long as they're following those, those guidelines. When you get outside of that, that's when things start to happen, when people are not following those recommendations for masking, hand hygiene, and social distancing. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Um, I have the second part for Laura's question. She's also a chorus teacher. Um, so would you recommend that they avoid um, or cut back on their singing activities? So the CDC most recently said, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, they, they now do recommend that you be masked inside the building. So I think if it is, I have a, a really good friend who was part of a choir and they as a group decided to stop just because they didn't feel like um, the mask was allowing them to kind of get the sound and everything that they wanted. But I also know people who are part of um, were part of core groups who continued to sing and everybody was required to wear a mask. So I think as long as you're following those rules, I would definitely not do it unmasked. Um, and but if you're able to do it while you're masked, I think that is perfectly fine. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Cantula. This comes from Angela. Uh, she says, how soon after getting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine can she get the double dose of either Pfizer or Moderna? That's a good question, Angela. I would say, um, and this is, there's probably no scientific evidence to support this. I mean, I would say you could probably get your repeat double dose, or sorry, your initial double dose of the Pfizer and Moderna four weeks later, but I think it may just be worth waiting six months um, because you, as I mentioned before, you are protected from getting any serious infection that would put you in the hospital. And I, I don't want to imply that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine doesn't work. It works. Um, yeah. 
And so that would be my comment about that. Thank you, Dr. Cantula. Um, I have another question. This is uh, from Stella, who says, um, is, are there anything, um, any things that they can do proactively to lessen the side effects of getting that vaccination? I know we talked about the pain at the injection site. Um, I, I, remember, I remember some of the side effects that I felt after fully getting vaccinated, um, a little bit of headaches, fatigue. Uh, what do you say to those who are experiencing um, those side effects? So with regards to the side effects of the vaccine, um, the approach that I took because the, the, the more common side effects being the soreness um, at the injection site and the headache and the fatigue and the, the chills and fever is, is what you would do after any other vaccine. Um, usually we recommend Tylenol or Motrin, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, if you're feeling that the side effects that you're experiencing are outside of what is normal, then that would be a time for you to contact your uh, pediatrician to talk about the symptoms that you're experiencing, especially if they're, you feel like they're outside of normal. And then thinking about the, um, the side effects that I mentioned before, um, just looking for um, you know, the shortness of breath and the palpitations. Um, seeing if, if your child is experiencing that as well. But for the most part, it's usually Tylenol, Motrin, hydration, and things that you normally do after a vaccine. But again, if it's outside of what you think is normal, definitely talk to your pediatrician. Great, thank you, Dr. Cantula. Um, I have one more question uh, for this portion. This is for Dr. Medley. It comes from Trina. Um, she says, uh, what difference, if any, is there between the potency of the vaccine um, in adults versus uh, children. Is there any uh, difference there? Um, so not specifically in dosing, but what uh, what was reported earlier was that kids were experiencing um, side effects more frequently. And part of that has to do with the fact that children have such a robust immune system. And so they were responding very well, which was a good thing. They were responding very well to the vaccine. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the only thing. There's really no major difference otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. I'll turn it back over to you, Andrea. All right, Rashan, thank you. And I have a follow-up question for Dr. Cantula based on what Angela was asking about the double dose after taking the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Is this CDC recommended or is this just something patients want to do? Are doctors and facilities doing this? So I, so I think it's more something that patients want to do after hearing some of the stuff about the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine in the media. And as I mentioned, with regard to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, compared to Pfizer and Moderna, it does protect you from getting serious in, in um, disease. Um, I'm happy if somebody wants to get vaccinated again, if that makes them feel more comfortable and more safe. Um, but like I said, I think I think it's worth waiting um, and worth waiting at least six months for it to serve more as a booster if, if they feel that, if that'll make them feel more comfortable. All right, Dr. Cantula, thank you for explaining that. And again, uh, following up with you, hard to predict how the pandemic will change over this school year, but it's certain it will. There are 48 million children in the US under the age of 12 who are not eligible to get any of the COVID vaccines. What is the status of vaccine research, Dr. Cantula, on this younger age group? Sure. Um, so there are two trials that are happening in the US right now. So that's the Pfizer and the Moderna trials. And like the um, adult trials and the teen trials, we're look, or the manufacturers are looking at safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity. The children have been grouped into three categories. So aged six months to two years is one group, two years to five years is another group, and five to 12 years is the final group. For the children who are five to 11, the vaccine dose has been lowered by a third, and then it's even lower for the youngest group, which is the six to the 12 year old, six months to 12 years, sorry, two years six months mm -hmm. to two years. Um, and both trials um, had initially planned uh, to recruit 5,000 to 7,000 participants in each trial. So for a total of 10 to 14,000. However, recently the FDA advised them to expand the study numbers so that um, they can try to capture the rarer side effects um, such as the myocarditis that we talked about. In terms of a timetable, I was able to see that Pfizer expects to have 
data um, or results in September for the older cohort in the study and for the younger cohort, maybe around October and November. Um, I wasn't able to find out um, information about when Moderna expects to release its data, but I expect it'll be around the same time frame. Um, what I would say is I would strongly encourage families who are interested in having their children vaccinated to consider participating in one of these trials. There's a 50-50 chance that your child will get vaccinated. Um, Pfizer does have local sites here. Uh, one is at Children's National, um, and then Moderna also has three sites in the region, one in Burke, Virginia, one in Frederick, and then one in Baltimore. And those clinical trials could make a difference for all of us going forward. Thank you for reminding us of that, Dr. Medley. Dr. Ahmed, um, well, Dr. Cantula rather. Dr. Medley, for the children who are eligible now for vaccines and may become eligible later, what is the best way for them to actually get a vaccine? What's the most accessible way for them to get a vaccine? Um, so, um, so actually most primary care sites are now able to give the vaccine. Um, children 12, like I said before, 12 to 16 can only get the Pfizer vaccine um, and uh, it requires certain storage. So initially it was only given at some of the mass vaccination sites that were close to hospitals that could um, house those, but they've since found that it's actually, there's a safe way to store those even on site at local um, pediatric offices. So the first place I would say for any parent to start would be to call their primary care doctor's office and ask. Many of them can get it there. And then if not, they'll know exactly where to direct you. And again, you would be seen as that trusted messenger. So that's a good place. Dr. Ahmed, if families do have access and are still hesitant, what does research show about what it would take to instill confidence and get them to move on getting the vaccine for themselves and their children? Um, as others have stated, it's really um, the vaccine data, right? Looking at potential side effects, long-term effects, and then the efficacy of the vaccine long-term. So I think as these vaccine trials continue and more data comes out, that will help cer certainly relieve some of those concerns. And additionally, we also need to leverage um, those trusted sources in the community, whether it be pediatricians, community members, um, teachers, principals, et cetera neighbors just to get the message out about the importance of getting vaccinated. You know, doctor, we've heard uh, from parents and we've even heard from some in the medical profession who are waiting for full FDA approval of the vaccines. They don't think that experimental is good enough. What's the status of full approval of the vaccines from the FDA? Right, so the latest news is that the FDA will be holding hearing soon on giving full approval for certain vaccines, and that can certainly help with vaccine acceptance, but again, that's dependent on if people trust the FDA, right? Mm. Um, I will say that um, full FDA approval might help with vaccine mandates, right? So we're seeing that some employers and schools are actually mandating the vaccine for their employees and students who wanna to return to in-person schooling. So the full FDA approval might help in that sense. Do we have any idea on a timeline? Uh, there was talk that it would be at the end of this year, but uh, I think recent reports saying it could be at the end of uh, September or even October. That's what I've heard as well. Um, I mean, we'll hear soon as the FDA releases their reports and any approvals that are going through for the vaccines. But I think that could help, you know, relieve some fears and concerns, especially given the emergency use authorization for the vaccines. Right. And again, for people who are hearing emergency use, this isn't something that was just developed overnight. This is something that has been in the works for years, not just months, but years. So it's not experimental in the sense we think of experimental, correct? Absolutely. There have been years of research, funding, trials, et cetera, that have gone into developing these vaccines. And so that, um, that classification of emergency use authorization, it has, you know, understandably raised concerns, but these vaccines have been rigorously tested and evaluated and they're continuing to be evaluated and tested. So these vaccines have undergone um, immense scrutiny um, and are very safe and effective. All right, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And Shrijana, just one thing from you as a parent, how do you feel knowing that for whatever reason there are going to be children in school with your children who are not vaccinated? Is there anything that you're doing to influence family members, friends, uh, people you come in contact with that's been working to convince them that the vaccines are worthwhile, let alone safe? 
Um, sure. So, uh, you know, I understand that is, uh, there are some parents, uh, they have a different opinion and different feeling about the vaccination. So I did and I decided what I thought was best for my family. Uh, and also, as I said, I really uh, understand for those who have different opinions. Um, towards your question about what I'm doing too. So, uh, I mean, you know, I haven't come across anybody who, you know, uh, in, in my circle um, of the eligible kids, uh, pretty much everyone uh, I have, I know they are, um, they have vaccinated their kids. Uh, but if, you know, if I ever come across, I definitely would talk to them. The only the fact I would highlight is that even if you get infected after getting vaccinated, people, you know, there is a very, very low chance that they will end up in the hospital mm -hmm. or need any ICU care. So um, I think that's what I'm, I'm going to do. I can't, like, uh, you know, influence somebody's um, decision, but definitely I would uh, definitely highlight the benefit and the uh, significance of this vaccine. Um, Listen to what yeah. they're saying and, and uh, yeah. try your yeah. best. Well, we're listening to our audience, Michelle. We have a few more questions we can fit in before we say goodbye. Yes, we do. Um, thank you, Andrea. Uh, my first question is for um, Dr. Medley. This comes from Angela, um, who says, uh, should we still be cautious of the virus spreading through the eyes? Um, as a teacher, she's wondering if she should continue to wear an eye shield. So it is definitely one of the ways that you can, any, um, any surface, any mucous membrane surface, mouth, um, eyes, um, uh, nose, any mucous membrane surface is a way of contracting it. And that's just, it's not just simply somebody breathing on you, but literally if they sneeze in your face, it can get in your eyes or up your nose or in your mouth, those types of things. Um, so I would say, yes, any anything that's going to protect you and make you feel more comfortable, as long as it's not impeding your ability to function and do what you're supposed to do, I think is perfectly fine. Um, and so if that is something that um, make somebody feel more comfortable, they should. As a physician, I still wear my goggles when I see patients um, every day in the office in, in addition to my mask. Um, so I think that that would be perfectly appropriate. Thank you, Dr. Medley. Um, I have a question for Dr. Ahmed. I think this is to one of our earlier points that was made about how the vaccine was developed. Um, this question comes from Kaya, who asks, um, how could the vaccine have been tested for years uh, but the virus just came out in 2019 slash 2020. So could you, um, I guess, just clarify to people how the vaccines were developed and the, the timing and the efficacy and, and, and those, uh, those things? Thank you for your question, Kaya. Um, so I do not personally develop vaccines, so I can't go into detail about how it's developed, but um, the scientists who work in this specific area, um, they work in the lab primarily, and the virus itself comes from a family of other viruses. So they've been able to develop based on research with those other viruses and just testing it um, in other ways in the lab. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else on the panel has further insights that they can share with Kaya. I can chime in if that helps. Thank you. No problem. So the technology of the mRNA vaccines has been around for a very long time. Um, scientists just hadn't started, had been practicing using it for, um, what is it, vaccines. However, the problem was that the mRNA, which is the genetic code of the vaccine, um, is very fragile when it just lives in the air. So scientists figured out a way to put it in, the, in what we call a lipid bubble or a nanoparticle. And so that was one of the big advances that happened with this vaccine. So basically, the vaccine is essentially this mRNA science that has been in place for a long time, wrapped around in a lipid bubble. And that was the new innovation, just because the lipid bubble allowed for the, the mRNA to be very stable. Um, and so um, um, adding to Dr. Ahmed's point is that there are other viruses that look very similar to coronavirus. Um, and one of the big things that happened with the, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus was very early on in the pandemic, scientists all over the world were sharing this uh, virus's genetic code, and that made a big difference. So once the genetic code was available to everybody, um, that's when the scientists got moving and made this mRNA that or that is the 
part of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I don't know if, if that helped, but I mean, I think it's very cool. Thank you, Dr. Cantula. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, um, for, for giving better uh, clarification um, to, to that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have another question. Um, I'll direct this to Dr. Ahmed um, about uh, some, some hesitancy when it comes to getting vaccinated. Uh, this question comes from Bonnie. Um, how about, uh, the, what do you think about the rumor or what do you say uh, about the rumor of infertility after getting vaccinated? Um, how do you address um, those concerns? Right. Thank you for your question, Bonnie. Um, so with the vaccine and the virus in general, we've seen a lot of information circulated, some of it that's accurate, some that's not accurate. Um, in terms of infertility, there's no current data to show that the vaccine causes infertility, and there's no indication that it would. Um, and to, you know, the various rumors or misinformation that are circulating, I think they just underscore the importance of continuing to push out information about the vaccine itself, side effects, long-term efficacy, et cetera, to sort of counter those um, rumors that we're hearing and also to use different platforms to get that out, whether it be conversations with neighbors and friends, using social media platforms, et cetera, just in terms of countering that misinformation that we're hearing. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I have another question. This is for uh, Dr. Medley. Uh, it comes from Natasha. Um, how protected would a child be uh, with just receiving one dose of the Pfizer vaccine or I guess um, the Moderna vaccine as well? Um, so Dr. Kentula can probably answer that better than I can, but with most vaccines that require booster shots. So when you have a vaccine that has two doses, typically when you get the first dose, it confers somewhere between 40 to 70 percent protectivity. And then that second dose is when you get closer to the 90 to 95 percent protectivity. Um, but specifically for COVID, Dr. Kentula can probably answer that much better. Dr. Medley, I think that was a great answer. Um, you summed it up. Um, I like to think of the first dose as the priming shot uh, to get the immune system ready for the second one, so that when the second dose comes, that's when the immune system really gets revved up and gives you that 97% um, or uh, efficacy that we've all been hearing about. Great, thank you both. Um, I have one more question if we have time. Um, this comes from uh, Kaya. Uh, for Dr. Medley, <clears throat> excuse me, she says um, she's nervous about uh, getting her 14-year-old son vaccinated after hearing things about the Pfizer vaccine and its potential effects um, in young males. Um, what do you say to, um, to patients? Um, I guess he also has a, sw a swollen lymph node as well. Um, what do you advise for people um, in terms of getting vaccinated? Should they get vaccinated? Should they consult their primary care doctor individually? What's, what's your advice? So I'm going to always say talk to your primary care doctor, right? Because that's a relationship typically that you have a trusted relationship with and somebody who you know is going to tell you exactly what it is, is the truth and you're able and feel comfortable talking to that person. That said, I always tell my patients, I never recommend something for my patients who I see as my own children that I wouldn't do with my own kids. So I have 13 and 15 year old um, sons. They've both been vaccinated. One of them has a chronic illness. So it was extremely important to me that he get vaccinated. Um, and so I always tell parents, if specifically if your child has a chronic illness, asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, any um, sickle cell disease, any chronic medical condition, those kids absolutely should get vaccinated because the risk of them becoming severely sick if they were infected with COVID is gonna be so much greater than any side effect that they're gonna have from getting the vaccine. So that's the first thing. But I think in general, all kids um, should be vaccinated. And again, as stated, the, um, that, that one rare side effect that we see, it's so rare that the benefit of vaccination far outweighs it. So, you know, I'm always gonna tell parents, you have to do what you're most comfortable doing with your child because, um, because that's your child. Um, but again, I would never recommend something that I wouldn't give my own children. And so both of my sons did, and they've been fully vaccinated since May. They were, the, they were first thing smoking in line when they said they could get it, so. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Medley. I'll turn it back over to you, Andrea. 
Michelle, thank you very much. Uh, as we said in the beginning, that parents would have lots of uh, big questions to answer before the start of school. And we hope you have gotten some answers from our experts. They've been marvelous. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Medley summed it up for us very well. Pay attention to what's going on in your child's school. Monitor the safety conditions. Ask questions of your school administrators about what's happening in the schools so you know distancing, mask policy, hand washing, air ventilation, all of those good things. We thank our panel for another terrific conversation, shedding light on this very important topic and to our audience for some very good questions today. Now, if you still have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine, we advise you to visit our website. It's medstarhealth.org slash vaccine questions for more information. And if you feel like you're now ready to register for a COVID-19 vaccine at one of our many vaccination centers throughout the district and Maryland, that web address is medstarhealth.org slash sign up. We end it by saying to everyone, please stay healthy, stay safe, and have a terrific school year.